Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tracy Mason. I'm the Assistant Dean of Communications for the College of Science at George Mason University. And I'd like to take a moment to welcome you to our first State of the College Address by our Dean, Fernando Morales Wilhelm. Please join me in welcoming him. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Uh, so I want to ask, what's protocol given this distance? Can I unmask or is that okay? Or you may, would you may unmask. okay? Yeah, that will make it. I mean, it's not that I don't want to do it mask, but I th think this is pretty safe, and it'll I think it'll be a be better experience overall. So uh, first of all, thanks. I'm really excited about being um, here today with all of you. Those that uh, are here physically, those that have joined us virtually. Um, and this is meant to be the start of a, of a number of conversations. So what I want to do today is share, sort of share with you some, some really basic information. Uh, uh, you, know, the, you know, one question that I've been asking myself since I joined is, is um, who are we? You know, who is, who is Mason? Who is the college? And it's taken me probably a little bit longer to find out. Um, but, you know, I've, I've, I've had very interesting, in-depth conversations with many of you, faculty, with staff, with students. Uh, um, and um, in this campus, in SciTech, and you know, uh, and, and it's uh, it's been it's been very revealing, and, and and so I've been trying to been trying to piece together. So this concept of doing a, a state of the college address, which I hope we can do annually, you know, I think it's uh, and, and I think the fall is a fantastic time to do it because it's great weather and we're coming back and there's this this whole taking stock of what we've done. Um, which I think is really important. It, it, I, I thought it's, it, will be, um, it will be terrific. So this idea sort of materialized over the summer. And uh, you know, the great staff um, uh, here at the college uh, and, and uh, GMU TV and others uh, have made it possible. So welcome, welcome everyone. So what I want to do today is, is maybe talk for about half an hour, hopefully, and maybe we can take some questions. Um, whatever questions we don't have the time to take here today, either the chat or here in person, uh, be happy to have those written down, uh, sent to us, and, and we'll get them. Re we'll get them answered. So, um, um, but let me let me tell you, uh, you know, um, you know how I'm seeing the college in, in, since my time here, and also how that has led to what I'm calling elements of a vision for the college. I don't, I don't think the vision has quite crystallized yet, but I think we have enough things going on to um, to visualize it and to. Um, and to establish it. And, and I really look forward to uh, working on those with you. So there's a little bit of wisdom and inspiration. You know, um, so it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is. It doesn't matter how smart you are. You know, if it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. And uh, that's a quotation from Richard Feynman, um, who's a physicist. Um, and I've been, been a great, great fan of Feynman since my college days. Um, and the reason I want to bring this quote uh, to your attention is because um, in, in, in this sort of year, year plus journey that I've done, um, I've, I've, I think I've learned how to be pragmatic. It's, um, we, need to, we need to find ways to make things work. Um, so you can, have, you can have whatever vision of the college you desire. It could be rosy, it could be fantastic looking, but if it doesn't match with reality, it's not going to materialize. And I'd rather have a vision that materializes than one that looks just beautiful. Okay? And it doesn't mean that the one that materializes has to be bad or ugly, but it's, it, you know, uh, the pandemic has thrown us into such a whirlwind of unknowns um, that it's, uh, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's, made, um, it's made my vision of being a dean, uh, you know, somewhat different than when I interviewed just a year plus ago, right? Um, that doesn't mean that different is bad, it just means that different is different, and we have to ad adjust to that reality. So this pragmatism is going to permeate quite a bit of my talk today. Um, so let's start with the, the who are we? So our motto is understand, innovate, and succeed. And that motto stands. That, that was our motto when I came here. That motto still stands. Uh, in terms of the understanding, we would want to do traditional fundamental science, education, and research. Uh, we are an academic institution. Uh, teaching and research, education and research go hand in hand. Um, we want to be innovative. We are the youngest, most successful university in the country. We need to leverage that. Um, we, have a, uh, we have a spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation. 
um, that I, I haven't seen in other institutions. So just by way of background, this is the fifth university in which I've worked. This is the fifth university in which I've held tenure. <laughs> um, so that should tell you something in terms of perspective. I've, I've been at, at three public universities. I've been at two private universities. Um, and, uh, and I haven't seen this, in this spirit of innovation as pronounced as I see it here at Mason. And I think it has to do something with being young, being a young institution. Um, and that's something that I'm quite, I'm quite frankly looking forward to living through, right? Um, and then succeed, you know, preparing students for careers uh, at, at the cutting edge. And, and you'll, you'll hear Greg Washington say quite a bit that we are in the business of success. Um, and uh, I completely, I've, I've completely jumped into that bandwagon because I get it. I get what a university can provide for a student. I get how a university can transform the life uh, of a student. I've seen it in our alumni, uh, you know, and we've been visiting with alumni for the past year in Zoom, virtually with masks, uh, without masks and separated, all the modes. Um, and the one thing I've constantly seen in the alumni of Mason is, is that signal that there was, there was my life before Mason and after Mason. And that's something we need to capitalize on. And again, I haven't seen this as much in other places that I've, that I've been at. So it makes Mason very special. Um, and I think the other piece that has also uh, materialized since I joined is this, is this renewed emphasis on inclusive excellence on diversity. And Mason has a great capital to start from. Uh, we are a very diverse institution. I'll show some more numbers, but this slide captures some of the key essences of, of it. Um, for instance, and, and many of you have heard me say this other times, um, uh, the College of Science is over 60% female at the undergraduate level. That's unprecedented nationally. Um, probably internationally, if, if, I, if I see the data. Um, in terms of underrepresented minorities, also at the undergraduate level, we're almost 50-50, not quite at 50, and that's something that we ne may need to work on because of the, of the communities that we serve and the communities that surround us, I think we could do a little bit better there. But with this renewed emphasis, I think we will. Our, our, our faculty body is pretty diverse. Uh, our graduate student body is pretty diverse. Um, and I'll get, to, I'll get to tease out that in in a, in a little bit of more detail, but nationally, we're also ranked as one of the most diverse universities um, in the United States. Certainly, we're the most diverse institution in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and we are also the youngest and most diverse institution in the nation. So that, that's, a, that's a combination, and, and I'm mentioning these traits because these are our competitive advantages. This is what we have that others don't. And we need to build Mason according to our, uh, those competitive traits and, and that identity that we have as a young, diverse, go-getter university. Let me slice you know, some data just to, to, um, so that we can understand a, a little bit more of this in numbers. You know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a scientist, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a quantitative scientist, so I, I I don't understand something completely until I see the numbers, uh, and people that work with me will tell you that, because <laughs> const I'm constantly asking for numbers, right? So this is um, bachelor's degrees awarded. Um, this is for the entire university, the, 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 the graph in the background. Uh, the, the green bar there is Mason. Um, jointly with Mason, we are in, 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 um, in gray, we're plotting the 130 plus Research One universities in the United States. Um, and in blue, we have the top 50 uh, universities ranked per the U.S. News and World Report. Um, so you can see Mason is, um, you know, awards uh, quite a bit um, of bachelor's degree, actually much more than both the median of the top 50 and the median of uh, all our ones. So this gives you a sense of where we stand in terms of bachelor's degrees awarded at the, for the whole university, for the College of Science, uh, we award you know, something in the vicinity of 500 to 600 bachelor's degree annually, and that uh, places just to, um, you know, my, my rule of thumb here, it's about 10% it's about of the um, bachelor's degrees that are awarded by the entire institution, okay? And I'm just putting those numbers out there to give you a sense of the who are we from that perspective. Um, 
This is the undergraduate enrollment. Um, and again, much higher enrollment than uh, the top 50, than the median of our ones. Um, and uh, in the college, so our enrollment is roughly uh, at the undergraduate level per these numbers, I'm guessing somewhere around 27, 28,000. Um, we are uh, a little bit over 10% of that in total uh, in this table, uh, in, in the little table that I have here, I'm showing um, the, the total enrollment and I'll re-emphasize this uh, male to female ratio, which is where the 60 plus comes from. When you look at um, uh, bachelor's degrees awarded to women, uh, we're certainly you know, much higher, and this is a consequence, of course, of our student body, but we're certainly much higher than the top 50, than the, than the median of our ones um, in the nation. So this starts giving you a feel for, you know, for, um, for, for that correct characteristic in terms of, 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 um, of gender. When you look at minorities, um, we also award um, much more degrees than um, there are, there are what we could see as our, as our peers or as our competition. Um, in the table, which is probably not as legible, but we certainly share the slides and you can actually look at them, uh, you can see that we're roughly, um, well, just a little bit of, uh, at the undergraduate level, just slightly below 50% in terms of minorities. When you look at student faculty ratio, so this is something that's um, um, uh, where we may need to uh, do some work, and, I'll, and, and later on I'll tell you why. I, I mean, I, I'm not necessarily uh, against relatively higher student faculty ratios, particularly not at this range. I mean, if you look at um, if you look at the median of the top 50, their student faculty ratio is below eight. If you look at the median of our ones, it's about 15. If you look at ours, it's just a tad over 20. Um, that's a little bit high, but that, there's a reason for that, um, and we'll work on that. But this is also something, it's a little look like, like taking an x-ray of our, of our student body and trying to figure out where we stand. When you look at the six-year graduation rate, this is also a, a, a where we, an area where we need to do a little bit more work. Um, you know, the, the top 50s are in the 90s, uh, the, the median of the R1s is in the 80s, uh, and we are in the 70s. Um, and, um, and, this, and, and this is percentage-wise. So this is something that we need to, to look into. Um, there also, there's also a reason for this, and we'll come back to that. Uh, when we look at retention, it's, it's a little bit of the same characteristic as the uh, six-year graduation rate. Um, we are, we're pretty high. We're close to, we're cl close to 90%. Um, but we, you know, we, we, have, we have competition ahead of us, and uh, that's something we can improve. When we get into, um, into graduate education, this is the, the master's degrees awarded. Uh, again, we award more degrees than our peers, um, or, or, or to the median of our peers, and certainly um, um, just as, almost just as much as, uh, as, the, um, um, as many of, of our other competitors. And, and, and uh, that's for the entire university, and this is for the college. And now when I look at the numbers for the college, so. Where let's say we're around 150, 160 master's degrees per year. When you see the university awarding close to 3,000, so we are more like 5% of the master's degrees awarded by the university. So this tells us that there is an opportunity there uh, for us to increase. And, um, and this is going to show again um, when we look at the PhDs awarded. And here is, is, um, is, here is where, we, where we actually uh, have a, of a lot of opportunity because um, the PhD degrees awarded are, are a reflection of other hosts of indicators. There are indicators of, of um, doing research with students, uh, uh, having fellowships and, and scholarships available to students, uh, and overall student PhD student recruitment. And we're certainly below not only uh, the top 50, but also the median of all our ones. So that's an area where we need to we need to look at more carefully. And this is a time history of the PhD awarded in, in the college, and, and you can see that, you know, if you look at the last five years, uh, we've certainly, it looks like the previous five years to that were relatively flat, then we had a little bit of a high, and then we're, we appear to be coming down. But when you look at the 10-year time series, we've been, we've been, you know, there's a little bit of, there was a little bit of a blip up um, but it looks like we're, we're, we're falling again into the pattern that was 
10 years ago. So we've been flat um, in this area, and that's something that we need to work on. Now, when you, when you look at um, an overall graduate enrollment, we do have a lot more students than uh, our, our top 50 and our R1 counterparts. So what's happening here is that we're not converting um, in, in, in an enrollment into a degree. And that's, the, that's an opportunity that we have. Uh, and um, just, I, I just pulled the little table for the college itself um, into the, um, um, into the uh, uh, just to show a little bit about a state versus in-state diversity. We look at women in, in graduate enrollment. Um, um, so we're, we're roughly 50-50 female, male, the graduate level. Uh, the university has significantly more women uh, in grad school than others. So again, so look at, look at that dichotomy between the enrollment and, and, and the degrees, which happens not only for the college, but actually at the university level. That's not, it's, it's not, a, um, it's not a, a problem exclusive of the college, or it's not a situation exclusively to, to the college. And when you look at minorities, um, so this is an area, um, this is the minorities in graduate enrollment. Um, this, we're, we're below the top 50 and we're below the, our, our R1 counterparts. So this is an area where we can do, um, we can certainly do better, particularly because of the community that we reach. Um, and um, and it, this is also needs to um, synchronize, be made compatible with the type of students that we recruit. Okay, so um, I think this is all going to converge when we start um, rolling out our inclusive excellence plans that have components specifically geared to this. This is where these are the indicators. Our R&D expenditures uh, also lag behind, and this is a consistent story. So, so think about master's degrees, PhD degrees, and now this is the, the research expenditures. At the university level, I'm going to show you the, the, the figures for the college itself. But again, they paint a consistent story that we, we, are, we are a nascent Research One University and therefore need to grow that graduate space. So these are the awards and the expenditures. To the, the graphs have the total for the university. Um, and the, uh, the figures in the bottom are uh, the College of Science. Uh, 2020, 2021, we're about, we're about 30, just a tad before th uh, under 35 million. For this year that just ended, we're just under 33. Um, the university has been, um, has been growing its expenditures and we're roughly at the 150 level. So we are, give or take, 20, 20, 20 plus. The university, that is not a bad figure. It's actually a very good figure. But I think we can go from being 20% to being 40% or 35%, a third. I think a third is doable. Okay. Now let's get to a, a, a subject that's, that's incre incredibly important, something that I've focused on since I got here because in, I knew it was a problem before I got here, which is faculty and staff compensation. Okay? So this is the average, this is a graph of average salaries, again comparing um, our professors to professors at R1 peer institutions and then professors in the top 50. And this is where you know, we're, we're really, really far to the right. Um, and the, the numbers, although the graph looks more dramatic, the, what I wanted to highlight is that when you take the median of the public R1 institutions, uh, the median is roughly, um, it's about 107K. Um, we are, and that, that's about here, we are about there. Um, and. Um, our, our, our median at the university level, I thought it was in this plot, but our median is like 10,000 K below that. So this is a 10,000 problem at the full faculty level. Um, before I continue, I, I don't have, we, we haven't, the university, and, and we haven't done it yet, we haven't crunched the data for staff. The reason is that staff is a lot harder because there's, there's um, um, the rankings and the, um, the you know, assistant associate full, it's not as clearly cut everywhere so that we they compare apples to apples. 
But I'm pretty sure, I mean, and I don't have to, uh, I don't have to, you don't have to be a genius to know that we're, the staff are also lagging quite behind. My sense is that we're quite lagging quite behind, perhaps at the same percentage levels. Uh, that it could be wrong, but that's something that we're looking at. Um, certainly at the university, from what I've seen at the highest level, uh, is very committed to, to, um, to addressing this problem. So this is um, for, um, uh, for, uh, for all ranks, but we actually have this um, broken down into, um, into ranks. So this is for the professors. So the professors are, um, even though there's been salary compression at the professorial level, at the full professor rank, the problem is less pronounced. Actually, Mason, it's a little bit better than the median of the R1 publics. You know, not by a lot, but it's, it, but it's um, and um, so it's somewhere between the median of the R1, R1 publics and the median of all R1s. We're, we're somewhere in that range. Um, but, you know, if you, if you look at where we are, and let's say, you know, the, the, the number here, it's, uh, it's roughly, you know, about 140K, give or take, uh, for that median of, at Mason. Um, you, if you look at the median of the top 50, uh, it's, it's much higher. That's, that's a significant salary jump. Um, and, and this, um, the, the reason why this is important is, and, and this, I know it's something that I've mentioned in the past, I've, I've, I've seen President Washington me mentioning it as well, is that um, Mason can then become like a, like a farming a far, you know, a farming institution for other institutions then to come and pluck our, our people and just, you know, give them 20K more salary and take them, right? Uh, that's something we don't, we really don't want to be in that situation, okay? Um, this gets more worrisome when we look at the associate professor rank where we're definitely um, on, you know, on, on the very right of that, um, of that graph. We are below the below the R1 publics, below the all the R1s, certainly below the top 50, and the, the salary difference is significant. So we are, we are there in the, um, in the 80s, um, and the for, as a medium for associate professors, that is not something we can live with, okay? And then we, with the assistant professors, it's the same situation. And this is, uh, this is very worrisome, because this is, this is when we are trying to recruit them for the first time, in most cases. Um, and it's very difficult to compete. So the one thing I did um, this, com this past year, we recruited uh, three tenure track, actually we ended up doing four in mathematics. Um, and we brought them in at a very, very high salary. We brought them in at top salary that, that were, were, because these people were, these individuals were so good that they were getting offers from other places at much higher salary. We were not gonna get, get them unless we did this. And of course, I had you know um, some resistance at some levels of the university to do this um, um, because uh, because the strategy is actually very clear. Um, if you bring in a junior faculty at a higher salary, you immediately from day one create an inequity problem, and an inequity problem needs to be solved. Um, so um, so my strategy there is bring younger people, junior people high, and then raise the others that are in higher to solve the equity. And uh, that's gonna cost us money, but to me, it is the quickest way, it is the quickest way to solve the salary problem, particularly at the assistant and at the associate professor ranks. It's, uh, and and, uh, and I I'm gonna stick to that plan. So for the hires that we're gonna be making um, this year, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, we, uh, that's, the, that's a little bit of the strategy, okay? Yeah, so there's a question uh, that was sent. Is, is salary adjusted for locality? Yes, yeah, so, these, so these, these competitive salaries that we offer to these new incoming faculty were competitive in that range. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's competitive in the sense, including, including the locality, and in, in the, um, the, um, the question is very, actually, <laughs> it's a very good one, very well rationalized. But that's, so to me, the, the strategy, to me, is simple. You bring, uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll be also very frank, I would, I would rather bring less number of faculty at higher salaries than try to bring more faculty at lower salaries. Because if you continue to bring faculty at low salaries, you're not gonna get out of the hole. So we need to bring, we need to make an effort and we'll invest money in bringing people, the most people we can that we need at the highest salary possible so we can raise all the boats up. Um, whatever the, the saying is, all the, the, the tide 
I never get that saying right, and I've tried to, uh, I'm going to have to memorize it. But you know what I'm saying, right? We want to have a tide that raises everybody up. If we keep saying, well, you know, uh, an associate professor here is making this, so you need to bring assistant professors low, we're never going to get out of the hole. All right? And I, and I know I create, I've created a, an uncomfortable situation in, with our math department colleagues, uh, but we will work on equity to bring the others up. And we actually started doing that already in some cases. We, I want to do this in every department. So we are a legit R1. Our accomplishments are there. We have the research expenditures. We got the great quality teaching. We got the great students. We, and we have fantastic faculty. Um, we have great support staff. We have uh, great research support staff to make it happen. All the ingredients are here. We're innovative. We're young. We're go-getters. There is nothing that stands between us and that destiny that we can see for us in a few years. Um, we have a significantly uh, larger uh, undergraduate student body. We have a lo relatively large master's st student body. We have a significantly smaller PhD student body that we need to work on. It's, it's the, the proportions, the ratios are not there. We need to, we, that's something we need to work on. We have, a, um, we have an average number of faculty, and this leads to a higher student-to-faculty ratio, and that's something we need to work on. And I'll, again, I'll tell you the reason why we want to work on that. Um, we have among the best percentages in female on the graduate and graduate enrollments in the country. That's something to, to boast. Um, we're a little bit below average in minority graduate enrollment. That's something to work on. So these are, I'm giving you some, some uh, broad strokes of what this vision needs to be, what our identity is. The tenure track faculty salaries are lower. Uh, they're about 10,000 below the median of our ones for the most part. And, um, and total faculty salaries, when you look at the, at, 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 at in all ranks, um, are actually closer than 10K, probably more like 8K. So this problem can be solved. This is not an unsolvable problem. Um, and uh, so that's, the, that's a little bit of good news. Um, our retention and graduation rates are probably lower than, 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 than they could be, but um, not as much as you consider our admit profile. I mean, we're really almost open enrollment, almost. So that means that our, our, our re you know, other institutions are able, better able to retain um, um, and have better graduation rates because they're, they're more selective than us. And that's something, that's something I have mixed feelings about, to be quite frank. So I, because there's the access issue. So I, uh, I'm, I, I'm not sure that this is something um, that, um, that uh, we, want, we want to tackle head on. I think we want to be smart about it, OK? But the reason we want to be smart about it is, um, is and I'm, I'm going to go back to my issue of being pragmatic. Um, so um, uh, we're fortunate in that um, one of my fellow deans um, was part for years of uh, the U.S. News and World Report ranking system. So, you know, he's, he's got the spreadsheets and he's, he's got the, the spreadsheets have the formulas and there's, there's a lot of indicators that go into the rankings. And um, so the president's office, so this is courtesy of of President Washington's office and, and their analysis. Looked, looked at these rankings very closely. Uh, this table has some of the indicators um, that, um, that are used. And we've highlighted the ones where we think that in relatively short term and with relatively little effort, we can, we can actually make some improvements. And let me give you one that's very simple, alumni giving. The way you as a news and world report ranks alumni given is not the total amount of funding which or the total amount of fundraising you would think is the number of alumni that contribute through fundraising so if we're able to make more contacts and more visits and get you know get the you know the the 100s the 500s the 1000s this you know gifts but it's the number of gifts and not the amount that counts that's one knob that we can work on and solve very quickly with not that much of a, of a huge investment. And it doesn't have to take a long time. Um, the, the Pell six-year graduation rate, let's, let's work on, um, on the graduation rates. The faculty pay rank, go figure. Huh? 
Who would have known, right? Of course you know. You know that if you don't have properly compensated faculty, this is why, and this is why I th the university has committed to, to working on this problem. Uh, Six-year graduation rate and class sizes. Both actually, class sizes that are smaller than 20, that's a good. Class sizes that are bigger than 50, not so good. So you, you want to work on both, right? Um, and then there's, there might be other parameters that we want to fiddle with. But we are, we are playing the numbers game now. Now, the, the good news is that we're not the only smart institution in the country. Everybody is trying to do this, okay? And the reason these indicators are placed like that in the first place is to keep you know, the top institutions being the top institutions. You know, it's a Stanford, Harvard, MIT, then it's MIT, Stanford, Harvard, and then sometimes they let Cornell slip in, and, you know, and then some Princeton, but it's, so the game is established. But breaking from where we are now in the US News World Report rankings of about 147 to, 100 to, to the top 100 is not a gigantic leap. So the president's office had ma so made the calculations, have run the spreadsheet with a number of scenarios and turning in some knobs. And this, so the, the nice thing about this, you know, and people may have reservations about rankings, I certainly do, but the nice thing about rankings is that they give you, they give you a way to quantify scenarios and, and try to, try to uh, guide how you invest your, your resources and your efforts in terms of improving them. Once you get into a top 100, you're in a different league. You're in a different league attracting students, you're in a different league attracting funding, and so on. So it's, that's a little bit of a rationale of, of what, where that's going on and why things like student-faculty ratios matter, why, why six-year graduation rates matter, why, what alumni giving matters, right? Now, um, let's look at the next you know, few years. So I've been dean for a year. My term is five, so I'm already in my second year. So I'm thinking I better, I better get, you know, get busy very, very quickly in terms of achieving something, right? Um, but um, by, by our calculation, we'll be adding about 40 faculty uh, uh, to the college and, uh, and about 15 to 20 staff. Um, in, and just to give you a sense, in, in fiscal year 22, which is the year we're in, we, you know, we've, we will add about 13 tenure track faculty, um, um, about seven term, uh, two professors of practice, 25 GTAs, um, and four staff. Um, and um, in fiscal year 21, we also added a base salary covering 50% of about seven faculty. So we had seven faculty in the college that who were only covered half of their time. Um, um, and that's something that when I came in, I said, no, we, gotta, we have to fix it right away because it is, it is an inequity, right? Right there, right? Um, so this is, this is realizable. Um, and, I, and I think, so getting to 40 faculty in, 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 you know, in the next four or five years is very, very feasible from my perspective, right? Um, and even, you know, even with, um, the risks of, um, of COVID and the alpha, the delta, the mu, and whatever, whatever many Greek letters come after that. Uh, we, we've been told that there's no plans to cut our budget this year. We did get it cut last year, okay? So I anticipate that these numbers are going to hold um, in terms of hires, right? Um, We'll probably add more or less over that same period of time, about 500 grad students, I, uh, undergraduate students. I think that's a conservative estimate. I think it could be more, but it's a conservative estimate. The, the good thing about um, doing it this way, it's uh, the, the budget model that the university has is almost entirely driven by enrollment. Um, and um, that's not only here at Mason, that's in every institution I've been at. Um, um, and um, um, and uh, for, for fact, for institutions that want to do research, this is sometimes it sometimes becomes a little bit of a um, of um, the word I'm looking for. It's um, it's it, it's it's a little bit difficult to realize. Um, and uh, but the the reason uh, because the, the, because university budget models do not reward research productivity. Period. It didn't doesn't happen here. It didn't happen in Maryland. It didn't happen any, anywhere I've been. Um, but the reason for it is that research actually has an indirect effect. Y if you do research, you become better ranked. 
your undergraduate enrollment, you're, you're able to recruit more students uh, and increase quality students. However, the budget model does not reflect that. So we're, the nice thing about Mason is that Mason is actually looking at changing its budget model. And that's a huge deal. I've never seen this. I've never seen this happen anywhere I've been, where the revenue that will come to the colleges is going to be driven, yes, partly by enrollment, absolutely. But if you, if you generate research revenue, in addition to providing indirects and the ability to hire on students and all that, uh, uh, graduate students particularly, postdocs, et cetera, productivity, published papers, all the good things we want to do, it actually has a kickback feedback effect on, on your ability to recruit uh, students. So it's, a, it's wonderful that Mason is looking at this realistically. It's not gonna, it's not gonna happen overnight, but it's gonna happen in a little bit. In, in a little bit. Um, I think with this growth, we will need to add an additional about $10 million per year. Um, um, and my sense is that Mason in, in the, over a decade can grow from 30 something to 50 something. I mean, uh, to me, that's the growth. But so in, in the first, so I'm, I'm just having that for the first few years. Let's get us to 40, 40 plus. I think that's doable. Um, if, we, if we recruit smartly, um, we'll be more diverse because we are investing in diversity um, we will have to thrive in uncertain, an uncertain and at times hostile economic climate. Um, if if the, the past year has been any <laughs> indication, um, we'll, be able, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll have to do that. And I think uh, uh, our coalitions and partners will be stronger than ever. Uh, I think our links to alumni, our links to, to um, corporations, our partnerships with the federal government, with the state government uh, need to strengthen to make this vision realizable. Just want to give you a snapshot of the budget. This is, um, um, uh, I've sh I shared this with, uh, in, in the faculty meeting about a year ago. Um, um, and when we did, um, when I did one of these first meetings with the faculty, um, just to give you a sense of where we are, um, I and I wrote to the right where we were a year ago. A um, uh, couple of things I want to highlight. I think first, um, first and foremost, our, um, our, what's called our expenditure authority, that's a permanent budget. Uh, grew. Last year it was 53 plus. Now we're 58 plus, almost $5 million. That is because we grew significantly in our enrollment, right? Um, this is what allowed us to go in this recruiting spree that we're on, right? That we're, we, we're, we're, go we're going shopping, right? Um, and, um, um, but we also, we've also spent not only those resources in um, new recruits, we have spent, spent a significant amount of money in um, improving salaries already. This, the salary improvements for both for faculty and for staff have, has already started. Um, and um, I'm, we will continue pressing forward very aggressively on that, okay? It's, um, uh, it, but, but I'll be, you know, I'll be, I'll be very frank because I think what I'll, what I'll tell you now will be very, <laughs> you know, very, very understandable. Um, as much effort as we'll put into this, as, as, as many resources that we'll put into this, it's going to take us some time to catch up. For faculty, for staff, for faculty at all ranks, for staff at all ranks, at all levels of experience, because we've, we, we, we've been systemically an underfunded institution. This problem is not going to go away overnight, but I do think that we can make a lot of headway in the times to come, and I'm committed to doing this. Um, and people that work in my office know this, people that work in the provost's office know this because I'm always you know, harassing them about salary increases that I've requested. Okay? It's a little bit of a dance. I don't get every time everything I want, but I'm committed to pushing and pushing and pushing. Okay? Um, and the investments that we're making in the decisions that we can make, so the things that I can decide where allocate resources are backing this up. Um, one observation I'll make is on, uh, so our budget is essentially like two, what I call it, it's like two big pots. One is the permanent funds. These are funds that are there year to year. And then there are the, the funds that are what we call one time that we use for things like investing in one time equipment or investing in faculty startups or investing in one time things. And the number for the, 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 the figure for one time funds between last year we were Last year we bought, we were about two million. Now we're just a tad under one. So um, this doesn't make me quite nervous, but it, 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 I, I'm keeping an eye on it. But it's also because this year we made significant investments in infrastructure and, and equipment. So 
That's, that's where the money has gone. Um, I, I vow to give you every year, and actually every time you want, we wanted uh, a, a report like this, because I want some transparency in the way um, you know, um, I manage the, the college funding. Um, so to me, this is really important. Again, being pragmatic. Now, there's some exciting things in the horizon. Um, I'm excited about implementing our inclusive excellence plan. I think it was, it was fantastic uh, when we did it, when I read it the first time, when um, we got uh, external reviewers to look at it, we received kudos, lots of good comments. And the nicest thing is that I had very little to do with it. <laughs> to be quite frank, I, I let the college constituencies do it, staff, students, faculty, and they came up with a fantastic plan. Go figure, who would know that if you let people do their thing, they'll come up with great things, right? Um, and um, so um, I'm looking forward to, to, to implementing um, the Inclusive Excellence Plan in, in, every, in every single faculty hire and every single student hire in our, in our recruitment of students. Uh, we, need to, we need to be more deliberate about this, particularly because of the numbers I showed you, right? We, even, th we th even though where we are and the communities that surround us, our minority enrollments are, uh, are, are not where they could be, okay? And, uh, and we have some stiff competition in this space um, that we need to live up to. But I'm excited about rolling that out and working with you on it. I'm looking forward to develop a college strategic plan. I mean, we, we've done, we've initiated the process with all departments, and there's got lots of good ideas in there. I mean, the nice thing also uh, about being here is that there's really no, um, no scarcity of great ideas. We're, it's, so we're not out of ideas. We're going to be actually have to be choosy about the ideas that we, cho that we implement and deliberate and, 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 and trying to match those ideas where, with this identity that we've mapped and with these needs. Um, there's groundbreaking research and educational activities. I'm, I'm, I'm naming a few here, but you know, in the, in the biomedical and health, we got lots of good things going on in earth and space sciences and computing and STEM and applications. Uh, um, and, um, and this is where I think the creativity of our faculty and, and, and of our students and, and the support of our great staff is, is going to be critical. And uh, um, I, I'm not, uh, I mean, I haven't been, and probably, I mean, I still consider myself to be a researcher and a professor. I'm teaching and I'm doing research still. Um, I, um, I am not a prescriptor in terms of saying, okay, the college is going to do, it's going to focus on only this, only this, only this. In an academic institution, in a research organization, that never works. You have to let this bubble up from the talent that we have. Every time we do a faculty search, we have to go after the best possible that we can get, regardless of whether they're doing X or Y or Z. And, and uh, I've had these debates with my colleagues over the years, because when I was, and I was department chair on this department faculty, and, and we would like, uh, well, we want to, you know, we want to hire, and I'm just going to give an example, we want to hire just a microbiologist. And I'm saying, you know, put an ad out that's broad, okay, let's see who we get, right? And if we get a fantastic microbiologist, like go for it. But if we get something else, a surprise out of left field, we need to go for these things. Because that's how you grow that bottom line. And crashing the top 100, I think, we, I think that's doable. I think it's doable actually during this term of me being dean. I'm looking forward to that. I, it, I think this is going to um, both require and result in a re-envisioning of the college for, for post-pandemic 21st century academic enterprise. Uh, I mean, and, and again, in this, this saying that we are in the success business, that is, that is, uh, that's, that's a fantastic motto for, for the university and certainly for the college. So um, some closing thoughts. Uh, uh, in, in, in part of my professional life, I, um, I, had, a, I had a fortune, I had, a, had the opportunity which turned out to be a great fortune to work a lot with economists. So I worked, I spent a fraction of my life in, a, in an international development bank, which where economists were the sort of the first class citizens and scientists were not so much. But one thing I learned um, about economists is that transitions are not free. People don't do, people don't change because it's better. They change if there is some motivation. Um, and uh, so this, there's actually a whole field of knowledge associated with this called political economy. Um, 
And um, um, I asked one of my colleagues to recommend some good reading uh, for this, and he recommended this book. It came out probably four or five years ago. Catchy title, Dealing with Losers, right? Um, the, whole, the whole point of the book, it, it goes through like 10 examples of transitions in, in the world. Um, you know, climate change. You know, what is it going to cost us to, you know, to transition? Um, one that caught my attention, um, because it's, it's fairly straightforward to explain, right? Um, it's, um, it's how slavery was abolished in the, in the United Kingdom versus the United States, you know, being, you know, being uh, very similar societies because of heritage and all these things. And the Slavery Abolition Act in the UK, um, you know, dating, you know, in the early part of the 19th century, you know, years before our Civil War, uh, it basically resulted in a compensation to uh, slave owners in plantations, um, very similar to the situation here in the U.S., that translated into today's dollars is $21 billion. That is a drop in the bucket for a national budget. They, they chose the cheap way, British, smart that they are, right? <laughs> um, and they, they paid their way through it, and they abolished slavery, little consequences. In this country, we had a civil war, 700,000 and more people dead. Still a historical heri heritage that we're living through today. Um, and um, so the message is that um, we need to invest in change. The transition of Mason and the, the College of Science from, from being, you know, what we used to be, a, a primarily commuter college, um, focused on education to a top-ranked research university, which, which because of our location and where we are, we should be, is going to request investing. It's not going to happen on its own, okay? And uh, I'm definitely convinced, and I'm going to put some muscle and finances behind it to accelerate this change. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I want to thank you um, uh, very much for, um, um, and for your time and, and your attention. Um, and uh, Tracy will not le let me leave this room if I don't remind you of uh, follow us on social media. Yes, follow us on social media. I'm, I'm, ju I'm saying that jokingly, of course, because I'm, I'm one of the first people following and posting and all the doing all these things that are important. Thank you very much for being here. I'm, I'm happy to entertain any questions. And, uh, and if we don't get to your question because of time, I'm happy to, um, uh, to certainly address them in, in, in writing. Yes. Um, thank you all for taking some time to join us today. Thank you. Um, we do have a number of questions that have been submitted by our group online, and we also have some questions by folks in the audience. We're going to entertain the question from the audience, but I didn't know if you wanted to acknowledge the students who joined us today as well. Absolutely. No, thanks. Uh, uh, you know, the, I always tell people that if you work at a university, it's because you want to work with students. I mean, that's the only reason to be. If I want to do research and I don't want to deal with students, there's plenty of places I can go, right? If you're a staff and don't want to deal with students, I know there's plenty. You know, if you're a finance person, if you're a fundraiser, if you're a marketer, there's tons of places you can go. This, is, this business is, the, is about students, is about the success of students. Go ahead, Lance. Uh, my name is Leota, and I want to ask a question about maintaining our R1 status. Mm -hmm. I really like your idea of focusing on the graduate students because other universities say write more grants write more papers but the faculty says i need graduate students mm -hmm. and i need top graduate students if we build from the graduate students up more good ideas will come to the faculty more scientists at the graduate student level will conduct exciting research that lead to grants and those graduate students will maybe stay on and be faculty and grow from below the trouble we have with graduate students, is, as we all know, is we don't pay them very much. Yep. And we, I'd say we lose the majority of our top graduate students who apply because they get a graduate GRA that's higher from Hopkins, let's say, yep. or even University yep. of Maryland. If we could just do more mm -hmm. GRAs, we're going to be able to then, awards for our graduate students who are applying, we'll be able to attract more yep. top graduate students and that's even, that's even more of a problem for uh, minority and underserved applicants who all get attracted away by much higher pay than, than we ever give them. And maybe we should go after some type of giving 
some type of alumni adopt a graduate student from an alumni. We've done that in, in our individual center in the past, and the uh, alumni who, who adopts a graduate student loves it. They come to their graduation, and it's, it's, a, it's a happy thing. So there's a lot of creative ways to encourage graduate students to apply, and you personally, you know, all of our graduate students compliment you for your, you know, personal efforts towards working with the graduate students. But I think that's the way to yep. keep our R1 because we're all worried about losing the R1. No, absolutely, and, and you're, no, you're, you're, you hit, you know, you hit that, um, that's, that head on. Um, the comment I'll make is, is uh, you know, it is, it is reflected in, in the rankings. Uh, it, it's, it's not. So we need to have we need to we need to increase our PhD enrollment for sure because people catch on to this. We're not going to be able to do that, and that that was my point about investing. If we don't if we don't invest, so it's not it's not just a matter of um, um, of um, uh, of deliberately trying to recruit more. It's actually paying them better, and, and this is part of the same systemic underpaying pattern that we've seen. Uh, so so we will, me, the ones know. that we do pay get the most publications yeah. when you look at the data. Exactly. So then, and it's, uh, you know, like, like an old mentor told me a while ago, um, it's uh, graduate student is the, is the, and I don't want to say this, say this in a pejorative way because he meant it in, in the right way. It's, they are, they are the, the, the most inexpensive research labor that you can get and also the most risk taking. You know, it's, it's, you know, you sort of, as you progress in your career, you become a little bit more cautious about things you're getting involved in. But it's, it's not, it's, sometimes it's just time crunch. Grad students are there for that, to take these big risks that even if they don't go anywhere, you learn a lot. So, yes, I, I completely agree. I have some questions here. I, I don't know how much time we have, but I'll, I'll go through a few of these. Um, so do you have data on how College of Science salaries compared to other units at Mason? Um, I don't, but that's actually, I mean, I don't have it on the tip of my hands, but this is data very, very simple to obtain. Um, and, um, you know, my sense is that we do have, and many of you know this, uh, we have like three tiers of, so there's, in, in, you know, in our, in our um, the colleges have been divided into three tiers, and then, you know, we, the College of Science is in the middle tier of salary. So we, I know we get paid less than engineering does, and engineering is up there with public policy, I think, and then, we're in the middle with uh, CHHS and others, and then there's, a, there's actually a first tier that gets paid even lower than the College of Science. Um, without seeing the numbers, I can tell you that those patterns persist over time because you know, that's why getting, um, you know, getting, uh, racing that bottom is so important because that's, that's what persists over time. Um, so there's, there's a couple of questions that come to, um, so uh, related to the same thing, uh, to the same item. So we've lost, uh, we lost some important staff over the past, uh, actually, f weeks. You know, um, We are working diligently to, um, uh, to fill in vacancies. And we have, a, so we, have, we have a search out already for the chief business officer. We'll be doing the same for human resources staff. Um, we're probably going to be recruiting another associate dean. I'm, I'm trying to assess what we need. And um, I ask a little bit for your patience here because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what is it that we need. And uh, I, it's, I, in, I've, been co I've become convinced that we don't need one-for-one -one swaps, uh, or at least not in all cases. We do need a new chief business officer, so I knew that from the start. We got that going quickly. Um, um, I, I want to look at the, my core of associate deans and try to see some, redistribute some responsibilities and then figure out what we need next. Um, so that's what's being done there. Um, um, is there salary data for research and instruction or faculty? Yes. So this, so these salary numbers uh, that we that, that university included are um, do include term faculty and do and do include research faculty. Um, I think those were all the questions that I got in writing. I'm like I said, I'm happy to. Uh, if you send me, uh, I mean, not only today, but if you send me any time a question, I mean, I'm. I'm pretty good responding emails, and if I if I don't respond, uh, it's not because I it's because I'm finding out. <laughs> um, if I can't find out quickly, then I'll tell you I'm finding out, and you know so. Um, but I'm happy always to to uh, provide these updates. Uh, um, I am meeting regularly with the faculty. Um, I'm happy to meet regularly with the staff, certainly with the students. Um, 
I think now that we're back on campus, um, 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 it's, uh, it makes more sense probably to meet like this, you know, uh, in, in person and have a conversation. So um, I look forward to doing that. Um, I've been meeting a lot with alumni, um, and, um, and that's been a lot of fun. So it's, um, it's, been, it's been a fun ride. I really want to, um, to thank you. Whatever I bragged about today, it isn't my doing, okay? I have been, you know, I've been, uh, it's not me, it's you, okay? I'm just, I'm just the bragger, and that I can do very well. Um, and, and I'll continue to do it. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be your cheerleader. I'll be your promoter. Um, um, and, um, uh, and I do see that th the situation, the situation that we see it can, first of all, I think we're in a good place. So I, I, you know, when I look at the overall picture, I think we're in a good place. I think we will be in a much better place, um, with the, with the new leadership that we have at the university and certainly in the college and, as we continue. So I'll stop there. I want to thank you again for, for coming, and I look forward to doing more of these in years to come. <laughs>